All right, so next up we're going to have Rahul Subramanian, and he's going to tell us about his investigation of a novel medication for the treatment of multiple myeloma. And um, he worked with mentors Dr. Um, Mark Busteros and Dr. Michael Agius, as well as Dr. Irene Gobrial. So thanks, Rahul. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll start by, ask, I'll start by answering the question, what is multiple myeloma? So multiple myeloma is a blood cancer caused by the uncontrolled division of, of plasma or B cells. So these are, the, ooh, oops. these are the cells in your immune system that are responsible for producing antibodies that defend your body against any sort of pathogens that could invade through your blood. So these, B, so these B cells are an integral part of your immune system. However, they can, start, they can start dividing uncontrollably due to genetic alterations that I'll talk about later. And when they start, when they start dividing uncontrollably, this, is, this, becomes myel, this becomes myeloma. And it's considered malignant multiple myeloma when these B cells start invading your bone marrow, which is a common, common symptom found in a, in a significant percentage of multiple myeloma cases. So there are, there are three distinct stages of multiple myeloma. There are two precursor stages and one um, malignant symptomatic stage. So the first precursor stage is known as the EMGA stage. And during the stage, the B cells have begun to divide un uncontrollably in your blood. And since they're constantly producing antibodies, you have increased levels of antibodies present in your blood. And these are known as M proteins. And when the, and these, um, the MEMCA stage has an elevated level of these M proteins, but the, there are no symptoms yet that are felt by the patient. And only about 15% of patients in the MGO stage will actually progress to, um, to full-on multiple myeloma. So the second stage is the smoldering myeloma stage, which is another asymptomatic stage. And in this stage, M protein levels are further elevated. However, um, the, the B cells have not yet the B cells have not yet begun to fully infiltrate the bone marrow. The patient does not feel any symptoms. And, um, and about 70% of patients in this stage will then progress to the final multiple myeloma stage, which is when the M proteins have reached a level that, that they begin to be present in your urine as well as your blood serum. And the B cells have begun significantly infiltrating your bone marrow. And during the stage, the patient experiences a, a well-classified well series of four symptoms known as the CRAB symptoms. So these CRAB symptoms include elevated calcium, renal failure, anemia, and bone atrophy. And all four of these symptoms are, are very commonly used to diagnose multiple myeloma in patients. So there are, there are a few different causes of multiple myeloma, but the most, common, the most common cause is a phenomenon known as gene translocation. So gene translocation occurs when a, when a section of one chromosome swaps places with a section on another chromosome. So in this representative example, a section of chromosome 20 is being swapped with a section of chromosome 4, creating these two altered chromosomes that do not, that do not have the correct length of the correct genes on them. And when this happens, uh, if you have a gene that controls the cell cycle that's suddenly being swapped onto a new chromosome, it can, be, it can become placed under the control of new regulatory elements. And it can become either overexpressed or underexpressed. And if this gene regulates the cell cycle, often this can result in uncontrolled cell division, which is, which is how cancer, um, and which is in, in this specific case, is how cancer results. So um, the reason this is such a big common occurrence in multiple myeloma is because B cells undergo this process called VDJ recombination, which is how they generate a huge variety of antibodies to target a huge variety of pathogens. So in VDJ recombination, uh, double strand breaks occur in the, 14th, in, in the 14th chromosome so that they can recombine and rearrange themselves into new permutations. However, when these double strand breaks occur, sections of DNA from this chromosome can then be swapped onto other chromosomes. And this is, this is, often, the, this is often the root cause of, multiple, of the start of my, multiple myeloma in many cases. And the, um, this, is, this can be found in a significant percentage of multiple myelomas, translocations with chromosome 14. So there are two main treatments that are used to, to treat multiple myeloma today. So the, f the first one is general chemotherapy, which is used for a variety of cancers besides multiple myeloma. And the second is a three-drug cocktail of lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. And both of these, two drug com both of these um, treatment methods have, often have severe side effects to the patient. And this is a, and this is a major issue. And the, so secondly, these, none of these treatments cause complete curing of the patient. In, 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 all, in almost all cases, the, patient is completely in, is, the patient's condition is completely incurable, and they will have to be on treatment for the rest of their life. And, um, and over 75% of, of patients will relapse after their first treatment. So the objective of my study was to investigate a new medication known as daraplatib for its potential treatment of multiple myeloma. 
So deriplatib was identified in a repurposing drug screen conducted by my lab to be effective against multiple myeloma. So what this repurposing drug screen is, is it's, a, it's a, a screen of a huge variety of drugs, all of which have already undergone FDA approval and are currently either in clinical trials or being used on patients right now. And all of these drugs are tested against a, sing, a single condition to, in a, in a way, brute force a medication that could be effective against multiple myeloma but has never actually been tried yet. So the prior use of deriplatib was for cholesterol treatment. However, it's never been tested on cancer before. So my project was aimed at investigating this medication for multiple myeloma treatment. So deriplatib's known mechanism of action is preventing plaque buildup by inhibiting this enzyme known as lipoprotein phospholipase 2. However, it's, we theorize that it could, uh, it could um, re result in cell death because there is a homologue of this protein known as um, PAFAH2 that, that could be related to this um, alternate cell death mechanism known as ferroptosis. And in ferroptosis, reactive oxygen, reactive oxygen species are created in lipids. And these, um, these reactive oxygen species um, can cause severe damage to cell, membra to cell membrane and other cellular components. So since um, deriplatib is, um, is um, modulating this enzyme, which is related to these lipids, we theorize that deriplatib could be targeting ferroptosis. So the first, the first experiment conducted was creating IC50s. So these essentially um, plot varying concentrations of the drug um, to, and measure cell viability after 72 hours. And we tested this on four different multiple myeloma variants. And, so, and the IC50 is the concentration needed to inhibit cell growth by 50%. So these are the four IC50s contained on uh, uh, the four IC50s created on four different cell lines. So each of these plots the increase in concentration with cell viability. And the mulpate cell line was found to have the lowest IC50 out of all, four, all the four cell lines. So this means that since this, the lowest concentration of drug is needed to inhibit growth by 50%, this means that the mulpate cell line is the most sensitive to deriplatib treatment. So then to make sure that this, that this drug is actually selective towards multiple myeloma and won't cause off-target effects to healthy cells, this drug was also tested on um, healthy peripheral blood mononuclear cells extracted from a healthy donor. So in this test, we, we tested the drug on two different multiple myeloma cell lines and the healthy control cell line. And there is a significant difference in cell viability at the 2.5 micromolar concentration with a p-value of less than 0.01. So this indicates that the drug is... is um, effective at selectively killing multiple myeloma cells, and the chances of off-target effects in healthy cells are minimal. So then to further investigate this idea of, um, of um, deriplatib triggering ferroptosis, deriplatib was paired with a known ferroptosis activator known as ML210. And what we were looking for was to observe synergy between these two drugs. And the phenomenon of synergy occurs when two drugs target similar or the same, path or same pathway but different components of the pathway. And what happens is that the effect caused by the combination of these two drugs is greater than the sum of the two drugs individually. So they cause this, this super additive effect, which is, a, which is characteristic of synergy and can often be seen when two drugs are essentially cooperating. So the first thing we did was create IC50s for, these, for this new drug to find out the range of concentrations. And then we, we created a synergy heat map with varying concentrations of deriplatib and varying concentrations of ML210. And we observed the, so this heat map shows synergy, and it, the, the blue indicates high levels of synergy, whereas white and red indicate no levels of synergy. So we observe synergy at low concentrations of deriplatib, but high concentrations of ML210. So this indicates, this provides evidence for the fact that these drugs are possibly cooperating with each other and both targeting the same, the, the same sort of ferroptotic, ferroptotic pathway, and provides evidence for the, for the idea that deriplatib could be targeting this pathway as well. So then to, to again, um, lo, lo, investigate further into this idea of ferroptosis, we added hydrogen peroxide to the deriplatib IC50 experiment because the hydrogen peroxide will induce reactive oxygen species formation, which, if you recall, is the method by which ferroptosis causes cell death. So we wanted to see if we could sort of co um, cause a boost in cell death by adding hydrogen peroxide and sort of observe a synergy that wouldn't be observed otherwise. So we can see in this graph that adding hydrogen peroxide augments the drop in cell death um, caused by deriplatib. And this draw, this, when, with no, when no deriplatib is present, hydrogen peroxide does not cause a significant drop in cell, in cell viability, indicating that hydrogen peroxide is actually contributing to the effect caused by deriplatib. And again, um, creating further evidence for the idea that deriplatib could be a ferroptotic drug. 
So in conclusion, daraplatib is a cholesterol drug that was, shows potential for less toxic multiple myeloma treatment. Its side effects are significantly less severe than current treatments used today. And it selectively kills multiple myeloma cells while causing minimum effect, minimal effects to healthy, to healthy patient cells. And preliminary evidence was found to support that this drug could be targeting a, fer a, a feroptosis pathway in multiple myeloma cells through both synergy experiments and tests involving hydrogen peroxide. So in the future, I hope to um, further investigate what this drug is targeting, perhaps by conducting either a Western blot or RNA sequencing test to measure levels of gene expression, and then also per perhaps escalating into mal mouse models once more information is known about how this drug functions. So I would like to acknowledge uh, my amazing mentors, Dr. Mark Basteros, Dr. Michael Agius, Dr. Uh, and Dr. Irene Gobriel of the Dana-Farber Cancer Center Institute. They're all amazing mentors, and I, would, um, I thoroughly enjoyed my experience there. I'd like to thank my CE sponsors, uh, Mr. John Yokelson and Dr. J. Michael McQuaid, with whom this without whom this experience would not be possible. Uh, my tutor, Ina, RSI, MIT, MIT CEE, and my fellow Rickoids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. Um, are there any questions? Yes. So this is a repurposed drug. There, there must, there, you said that by definition, therefore, there is experience of this drug actually being used in humans for other purposes. Is there evidence that your proposed mechanistic pathway uh, for cell death is actually being observed in actual human models of people who have gotten the drug at tolerable concentrations? Yeah, so the question was, since this drug is already being used in clinical trials on humans, is there any evidence to support that this could be targeting ferroptosis in these patients? So it's interesting that you say that, because the, the enzyme that it targets in the clinical trials is an extracellular enzyme for, that causes atherosclerosis. So the, the, the drug actually targets this enzyme outside the cell. So inside the cell, we don't know exactly what this drug is targeting. We, the, we have, there's a homolog that, it's the, that we're, we've theorized it targets because it has a similar um, residue. It's a, it has similar residues with the um, original um, atherosclerotic enzyme, but we don't know if it, we don't know for sure whether it's, it's, it's actually targeting this enzyme within the cell. So no one's actually observed. No one's actually looked to see if it causes ferroptosis in the, the clinical trials that are currently being conducted. So um, yeah, this has never really been investigated before. Other questions? Uh, yes. In the uh, ferroptosis under hydrogen peroxide test that you showed, uh, that one right there, do you have any understanding of why hydrogen peroxide causes more cell death once you get only to the high concentration, but you don't see any difference at the middle concentration? So, yeah, so the question was why, does, uh, why do you theorize hydrogen peroxide only causes a, an increase in cell death at the higher concentration, not at this middle concentration? So we, get, so we theorize that this is perhaps because it, um, a, a decent amount of daraplatib is needed to, to, trigger the, to trigger the ferroptotic pathway and um, to cause, the, to cause a noticeable synergistic effect with hydrogen peroxide. So enough reactive oxygen species have to be created so that um, it can really um, be synergistic with hydrogen peroxide. So at least that's, a, that's, a, that's our theory. So um, we, yeah, at, at lower concentrations, um, the hydrogen peroxide probably does not interact with the path, the hydrogen, the pathway is not triggered to a high enough level that the hydrogen peroxide can really interact with the ferroptotic pathway. All right, um, I guess if there aren't, oh, oh there is one. Okay, sweet, what's your question? Yes. Yeah, um, how did you choose this series of experiments? So, so the question is how did you end up choosing this series of experiments? So the first thing, I mean, generally IC50, doing an IC50 of any new drug you're trying to investigate is standard protocol for um, for any sort of drug development investigation, just to find out what range of concentrations is needed to, to be able to use the drug and to sort of give you a benchmark for further testing. Then after that, um, we kind of, we had a hypothesis after observing the homologous proteins that it could be targeting some sort of ferroptotic pathway. So then we decided to kind of tailor make experiments that could um, lead, that could give more evidence for um, this drug targeting ferroptosis. So we, that's how we decided to pair with a known activator of ferroptosis and then also a compound hydrogen peroxide that's known to cause the cell death mechanism that ferroptosis uses. 
Oh, um, I see you back there. Um, I Can you guys in the back raise your hands a little bit higher? I'm short and can't see over the heads in the front. But yes, um, you in the plaid shirt. Uh, a quick question. So how, how does the concentration that you're testing here uh, relate to the concentration that it's used as a cholesterol drug? Um, so that's a, so the question is, how does the concentration you're testing in these studies relate to the concentration that's um, being used as a, cholesterol, uh, as a cholesterol drug in trials? And I'm not exactly aware of what the, the concentration that's being used for cholesterol trials right now. I do know it's a rather, um, it's a rather high concentration, and it's being, the, drug, the drug is being administered daily because for cholesterol treatment, a decent amount is needed to, to cause a um, significant... Um, uh, Removal of plaques, but I'm not. I'm not completely. I'm not completely aware of what the exact concentration is. But I do know it is a high concentration that is being administered daily. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Yes. How was it uh, identified in the repurposing screen? What were you actually screening for? When that happened? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, how is this identified in the repurposing screen? So this repurposing screen had a huge variety of drugs. So we all we just looked for. This is an experiment conducted before I got to this lab. So they just looked for which drugs caused a significant drop in cell viability in a, in like a specific multiple myeloma cell line. And then they chose the top 10 hits. And then this drug was the least, um, least described out of all of the drugs, because most of the other ones in the top 10 were either already being used in cancer or well described um, for, for similar diseases. So, mo so they, were all, they were all pretty well known in literature. However, this drug was not well described for cancer, in fact, there's very little. There's almost no data about how it could function in cancer, um, in cancer treatment. All the data is about um, potential cholesterol treatment. All right. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Rahul.